Okay. So I would like to go back to the end of chapter 19 and talk a little bit about um, batteries and meters and capacitors. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to share my screen, which means that you'll no longer see a professor with glowing purple eyes, which is a reflection from my screen. Um, but which, it's whatever makeup, whatever the last makeup quiz was, was it 17 or was it, no, it was 18. So what I wanna talk about here is uh, real batteries. Um, this is section 19.5 in the textbook. And uh, what's the difference between a real battery and an ideal battery? Well, charges moving through a battery have finite mobility. They can't move infinitely fast. And uh, some of the work done by the battery ends up heating the battery. So we model this as if the battery, uh, a battery was a, just a power, a power source with our standard battery symbol here in series with a resistor, which we call an internal, resistance so that a circuit that had a battery and a light bulb we would actually model as the battery with an internal resistance and then the resistance of the light bulb. So this combination is called the is is the real the real battery here. Um, so what does that mean? That means that a loop equation for this circuit would look like this. So a delta V round trip would equal the EMF of the battery minus the internal resistance times the current minus whatever this resistor is times the current equals zero. So this is the potential difference across the battery this is the potential difference across the internal resistance. And this is potential difference across the resistor. <clears throat> um, a fresh D cell like, like the ones you've been using in, in lab has an internal resistance of something on the order of um, about a quarter of an ohm. Um, so let's think about what would happen if we connect different resistors uh, to the battery in a circuit like, like, uh, like this one that we've drawn up here. So consider different resistors. <clears throat> So um, we'll say this is the resistance. This is the current if the battery is real battery. And this is the current for a real battery. So let's say we have a 100 ohm 
resistor hooked up to, we'll say the battery, um, the EMF is 1.5 volts, just like your D cell. <clears throat> so for a 100 ohm resistor, if we didn't consider the internal resistance, then we just have I is 1.5 volts over 100 ohms or 0 0.015 amps. In the real battery case, we have the current is 1.5 volts, the MF of the battery, divided by 100.25 ohms, which isn't really very different. It's about 0 0.01496 amps, so not much change. If we have, uh, now for an ideal battery though, if we make the resistance smaller and smaller, the current just keeps getting bigger and bigger. So if we have a 10 ohm resistance, we get a current of, 0 0.15 amps. Uh, if we have a one ohm resistor, we get a current of 1.5 amps. And if we add, we don't have any resistance at all, so we add um, zero ohms here, the current would be uh, 1.5 volts over zero, which would be infinite, which is probably not what we're really getting. So let's see why not. Uh, here we have, if we have a 10 ohm resistor, now the current would be 1.5 volts over uh, 110 ohms. 10.25 ohms, that's what I really mean, okay, which is just the sum of the resistances of, of the total resistance here. And so what we're going to get is about um, 0.146 amps, still not very different. When we get down to one ohm, though, we find that we have 1.5 volts over um, 1.25 ohms. And now we're getting only 1.2 amps instead of 1.5 amps. And in the case where we have zero ohms, I would be uh, 1.5 volts divided by, well, we still have this internal resistance, 0.25 ohms. So we'd only get six amps, which indeed is about the short circuit current from your battery. Um, now let's see here. Is there a way I can actually see the chat while I'm sharing a screen? Uh, Okay, I don't think I can actually <clears throat> see the chat. I'll have to experiment with that. So what I'm going to do is stop sharing my screen for a minute and see <clears throat> if you have questions. Okay, so what question is, what does short circuit um, actually mean uh, in this sense? And what a short circuit really means is that uh, you've added something close to zero resistance to your circuit. So in your case, you could make a short circuit with one of your batteries simply by taking that long red wire in your electricity kit and connecting that directly to the battery. And you did that actually when you were measuring the magnetic field of a, of a current in a long straight wire, so you made a short circuit. Um, the idea is that that wire doesn't have zero resistance, 
So, but it has very low resistance and probably low compared to the internal resistance of the battery. So the total resistance of the circuit was really dominated by the internal resistance of the battery. And so instead of getting an infinite current, you got a six amp current. Now you might not have gotten a six amp current if your batteries were old because um, the internal resistance of the batteries increases as they, they age and they use up these molecules that are reacting to, to release electrons and, and uh, take them up on the other end. And so um, so you might have had less than a six amp current uh, in your, your short circuit you made with the long straight wire and lab. Other questions about that? Okay. I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen for a minute just to talk very briefly about ammeters and voltmeters. Now you've used the voltmeter uh, in lab. So, <clears throat> and you've used a voltmeter to measure potential differences in lab. And so you built some circuits that involved light bulbs early on. And <clears throat> You use the voltmeter to measure potential differences across the light bulbs. And what you did was to measure this, you'd, here's your voltmeter. Um, you'd connect, um, the leads of your voltmeter on either side of the light bulb and you'd get some some reading here of, of 0.75 volts or something like that. So you'd measure the potential difference between one end of the light bulb and the other. So notice that when you did this, you were building a parallel circuit. And what we saw with parallel circuits is that if we have a situation where we've got, so here's our light bulb, but if we had another resistor in parallel with the light bulb, it was the combination of both resistors. So this is the bulb and now this is the voltmeter. Um, the combination of, of resistors in parallel changed the current through the circuit a lot. In fact, it could increase the current through the circuit a lot, uh, especially if one of these things had fairly low resistance. Well, we don't want the voltmeter to change the circuit. So um, how do we keep the voltmeter from changing the circuit? Well, the way, to, the way not to change the circuit is very much is to give the voltmeter very high resistance. So a voltmeter, your light bulbs had resistances on the order of 10 to 40 ohms. A voltmeter has resistance of, on the order of 1 million ohms a mega ohm or something like that or more in order to not really change very much as little as possible the current running through the circuit when you're measuring a potential difference now i don't think that you actually got to use an ammeter but in, and the same meter you used as a voltmeter can work as an ammeter. All you have to do is 
uh, is just switch the dial so it's and switch the, the leads. And when you use an ammeter to measure current though, what you do, so suppose you wanted to measure the current in this circuit, um, what you do is you actually have to put the ammeter in series in the circuit. So you break the connection and you attach one lead of the ammeter here and one lead here and the current actually flows through the ammeter. So this is a voltmeter in parallel. This is an ammeter in series. And now we've made a new series circuit. Because the ammeter is a resistor. So, what is the characteristic we want for an ammeter so that it doesn't change the change the circuit very much? So what we've got here now, if we draw it out in is, here's our light bulb, here's our ammeter, here's our another light bulb. So in order not to change this circuit very much, we want this to have very low resistance so it's as, as close to uh, a wire between these two other resistors as possible. So an ammeter has very 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 low resistance. Um, I don't remember exactly I think it's on the order of um, <clears throat> milli ohms or maybe micro ohms. So when we're making measurements, uh, when we're making measurements on circuits, we actually uh, are, okay, so that, do you agree that was a series circuit? Okay. So does a greater resistance due to a battery or wire mean that more energy is lost for heating up that part of the circuit? Well, of course, when you have greater, you increase the resistance, you totally change the current. So the total power output of the battery may or may not be different, but but the key issue with what that you ask about is is right that that when um, something has a lot of resistance, it gets hotter, and so a lot of the energy output of the battery is used to heat that part of the circuit that has high resistance. Okay. Questions about that? All right, I'd like to show you uh, briefly a, an analytical treatment of what happens when you put a capacitor in a circuit. We've seen you've experimented with capacitors and you've seen that when you connect a capacitor, an uncharged capacitor to a battery and a light bulb, the light bulb is initially bright and then gets dimmer and dimmer and finally goes out. And in fact, 
you did a lab on that and wrote a lab report on it. Um, let's see what we can understand quantitatively about this. So let's uh, go back to screen sharing here. And we're going to talk about capacitors and circuits with the tools that we've developed for chapter 19. So So let's consider a simple circuit that's got a battery and a resistor and a capacitor. And this is the circuit you built um, in lab because this is the light bulb and that, that's the capacitor. So that's the circuit you were experimenting with in lab. Um, and at any time, so this is a this is a circuit, and so we can write a, a loop equation for this capacitor circuit. This is called, by the way, an RC circuit. Where R means resistor and C means capacitor. And you'll see that these circuits can actually be useful in timing things, and we'll figure out why. So at any time, it doesn't matter whether the circuit is charging or discharging or whatever, um, we still know that, that the round trip potential difference has to be zero. So we can write an, a loop equation for this circuit, we have delta V round trip is, we'll go that way around the loop. So it's the EMF of the battery minus um, the potential difference across the resistor, which we found was the current times the resistance. This is delta V resistor. So that's minus IR. And then we have the potential difference across the capacitor. And remember that um, we defined back in the day, we defined capacitance in terms of, of uh, charge and potential difference. So capacitance The amount of charge on the plate of a capacitor at equilibrium at any time was was equal to the capacitance times the potential difference across it. And remember that um, capacitors are labeled. Your capacitor is was a one farad capacitor. Um, so we can write the potential difference across the capacitor in this uh, equation here is just the charge on the positive plate divided by the capacitance of the capacitor, and that should equal zero. And that should be true at any time. So let's consider two special times. One is the final state where it's at equilibrium. The capacitor is completely charged. Um, we have, we're just going to rewrite this equation. We have the EMF of the battery minus the current in the circuit times the resistance of the light bulb, but the current in the circuit is now zero. 
So the potential difference across the resistor is zero. And we have Q over C equals zero. So the amount of charge on the positive plate of the capacitor is just equal to the EMF of the battery divided by the capacitance of the capacitor. Um, another special time is the initial time. Um, just the instant after connection. So we have the EMF of the battery minus the potential difference across the resistor. There is a current flowing, so that's not, so this, this potential difference across the resistor minus IR is not zero. Um, minus Q over C equals zero, but initially Q is actually zero. Uh, so, so we get here that the initial current is just equal to the EMF of the battery over the resistance, and that's the same as if the capacitor weren't there. Now, at some in-between time, when the capacitor is not yet fully discharged, um, but uh, in the process of, I mean, not fully charged, but in the process of charging, uh, some arbitrary time. We have both terms are non-zero, and so we have, and so we can get that the current is equal to the EMF minus this term Q over C, um, the potential difference across the resistor, divided by the resistance of the light bulb. Now, the rate at which charge accumulates on the positive plate of the capacitor is dq dt. But that has units of coulombs per second. And in fact, that's just the current. Because if 0.1 coulombs per second are flowing onto flowing through the circuit, 0.1 coulombs per second are flowing onto the positive plate um, of the capacitor. And so the current is the rate of change of the charge on the on the plate of one of the one plates of the capacitor. So we can write this equation now. Our, um, so if I is dQ dt, and that's equal to EMF minus Q over C over R, then we can rearrange this and we get dQ, the amount of charge flowing onto the capacitor in a time dt, is equal to the EMF minus Q over C over R times dT. So, well, that's, and now we can do a numerical integration the way we've been looking at motion or in the, the context of forces. So we could say in one step, Q is 
the previous Q plus delta Q. And we could actually write a program to, to model this. So let's see how that works out. So I think I have to st stop. So wouldn't what be EMF times C? <clears throat> So in the initial state, uh, the final state, um, oh, did I make an algebra mistake? Yep. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> okay, other th other things? <clears throat> yeah, okay, I just corrected it. You'll see that in a second. <clears throat> okay. Now this this equation looks like one that we could just write a program to solve. And so, of course, we turn to glow script for this. And so here is Here's a glow script program. Let's make it a little bit larger, maybe. So what's it doing? Well, this is just setting up some graphs. We've described this circuit as a, a 40 ohm resistor. That's uh, the resistance of the long light bulb, I think. Um, here the capacitance, well, let's make it, let's make it one farad, uh, three volts, and we're gonna let it run for 240 seconds. Now, what is the program doing? Well, we have, we just took this equation, we just wrote dq, the amount of charge. We start out with q equals zero and time equals zero here. The amount of charge flowing onto the capacitor in a time dt just comes from emf minus q over c times dt the whole thing divided by r and then we're just going to add that to the charge on the capacitor and graph it and when we run the program we see that the charge builds up and eventually levels out to three coulombs which is three, the EMF of the battery divided by um, one farad, times one farad. Now, what would this imply for the current? Well, the current is, of course, dq dt, so it would just be dq, the amount of charge that went onto the capacitor divided by delta t. And so if we plot the current and another curve, and I think I'm gonna to have to make this a little smaller to get both graphs on, we see that charge versus time rises and levels off and the current drops eventually to zero over time. So we're able to, to model, to use this equation to make a prediction um, of what we should see. And in fact, that does look like what we saw in those lab experiments that we didn't 
we didn't see the charge on the capacitor, but what we did see is the brightness of the bulb drop and get very, very, very dim and then finally go out. So that definitely is what current versus time looked like in our experiments. And of course, the, the higher the capacitance, um, the longer this should take. Um, so if we make the capacitance, well, let's see. If we make the capacitance four farads, um, we're not we're not quite to a, to the end in in two hundred. Maybe we have to let it go for longer than two hundred and forty seconds here. If we make the capacitance smaller, or make the capacitance one farad, but we make the resistor. Uh, 10 ohms, which is like the, the round bulb, um, that all happens much faster. It really takes much less time. So the time to charge or discharge depends on both the, the, uh, the resistance of the resistor and the capacitance of the capacitor here. Okay, so we can do that numerically, but we can actually also do it analytically using calculus. So let's see what that would look like. Back to pencil and paper here. Um, <clears throat> What we have here is an equation that has a derivative in it, so it's a differential equation. Um, and our, our result looked like an exponential. So, so I versus versus t looked like look, looked like an exponential so one way to solve a differential equation is actually just to guess an answer so we'll guess that the current as a function of time is equal to the initial current i0 times e to the minus some constant times time, we'll call the constant alpha. Um, we had an equation that said I is dq dt, which was um, the uh, EMF minus Q over C over R, which we can write as EMF over R minus Q over an RC. Um, if we differentiate that, we get DI dt is equal to, well, that term is constant. So what we end up is a minus one over rc dq dt, but that's just i. So we have um, a minus one over rc times i. Um, and that does what an exponential is indeed a function that is its own derivative, uh, modulo a constant. So let's plug in our guess. Um, 
if i is equal to i zero times e to the minus alpha t we'd have di dt is equal to i zero the, the time derivative f i zero e to the minus alpha t which is a minus alpha i zero e to the minus alpha t <coughs> And that suggests that that this alpha, this constant alpha, is in fact this one over r times c. So our possible solution did satisfy the differential equation. So we get an equation i is EMF over R, which is the initial current I zero, times E to the minus T over RC. And this is an analytical solution for any time T. This quantity RC is called the time constant for a circuit with a resistor and a capacitor in it. And you can, so when, when because when T equals RC, uh, the value has fallen to one over E of the original, to one over E of the original value. So, and that's about 0.37. So it's, so every, uh, for every time RC, we fall another 37% of the way. So let's think about your light bulb. Um, your light bulb was, 10 ohms, that's the round bulb. The capacitance was one farad. So RC was 10 seconds, which means that in 10 seconds, the bulb had fallen to 37% of its original, of the current had fallen to 37% of its original value. Now the brightness is proportional to the power, and so that would be, um, the power is the proportional of the current squared. Um, so the brightness has fallen even more. And in fact, uh, the bulb is very dim because remember the bulb is not an ohmic resistor so that it can get, uh, when it's not very hot, it isn't getting off much light. So it's not the greatest ammeter in this situation. <clears throat> But 10 seconds is consistent with the time we were seeing for, for charging up the capacitor through the round light bulb. So this is, would this be an accurate equation for other types of circuits or just this one? Well, it's a circuit with a resistor and a capacitor. Um, and uh, so it's a, our solution is for a resistor capacitor circuit. Uh, and you can see that this could be used in timing because current would go out in a time, you know, two RC or whatever, you can watch the change of current. So RC circuits are used in fact is in timing in uh, electronics. Although now there are other ways to do it. <clears throat> other questions? Okay. 
What time is it? I thought maybe one thing we could do would be to work a problem that um, to work a problem from the textbook that just helped us review some of the things about circuits. So my proposal is that we look at uh, a problem from the textbook, problem 66 in chapter 19, and talk about how we go about solving it. So here is the problem we have here uh, a circuit that's, let's see if I can make this all a little bit bigger. A circuit that's got three light bulbs, two in parallel, one in series. And right now there's a switch in it that's actually open not closed and we're asked and we're given the resistances of these bulbs they're all different and we're asked various questions about this circuit so i thought it might be a useful review to just go over this problem there's kind of a lot of good stuff in it <clears throat> um so the first thing we're asked about with the switch open is what is the charge on the surface of the circuit going to look like? So I'd like to ask you to think about that for just a minute. The bulbs are not lit when the switch is open because there is no current flowing, despite the fact that um, Uh, that it, there's, it's shown on the draw, diagram as being lit. So the electric field inside each of these bulbs must be zero. So it, it so at equilibrium, everywhere in 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 the bulbs and the wires. Now, actually, if there isn't charge on the surface of the wire, the electric field will not be zero because these batteries do have charges on their ends and they make a, make a dipole field. Uh, so we do need some charge on the wires to contribute to making the electric field zero everywhere in the wires. And what's going to happen is we'll have a buildup of positive charge on the wire, presumably with more at this end, and a buildup of, on this end, negative charge along this wire with a little extra negative charge here in such a way to make, um, to make the electric field zero everywhere. Now the second question says, with the switch open, find the potential differences VB minus VC. So B is down here, B and C are the, the switch, and VD minus VK, which is across this parallel branch of the circuit. So B is switch open. Um, v sub, what is it, D minus V sub K and V sub B minus V sub C. Well, 
VD minus VK in this circuit is going to be equal to the potential difference across uh, across the light bulb. So it's going to be equal to VF minus V sub E. Maybe we should write approximately equal to say that they're, they're, the, they're connecting wires, although in this case, the field there should be zero two. <clears throat> and that's equal to the electric, I and mean, we can think about it two ways. We can think about it as equal to minus the electric field in the bulb times the length of the filament, or we can think about it equal to the current times the resistance. But in either case, this is going to be zero because there's zero current flowing and the electric field in the, in the bulb must be zero. Now, what about the potential difference across this open switch? So VB minus VC. Is that zero or not with the switch open? Well, if we write a loop equation, so we can take a loop that, um, goes that way. So we have plus EMF plus delta V uh, BC plus we'll go through the bottom bulb delta V H G plus delta V M L zero. Since there's no current, we know that those are zero. And that means that this potential difference actually must be equal and opposite to the EMF over the of the batteries. So we end up with concluding that delta V B to C is equal to the minus EMF of the batteries. Now, how can that be? There's no current flowing there. Well, we did note that there is charge accumulated here on the ends of, ends of these wires. So there's charge on the end of that wire, and there is positive negative charge on the end of this wire. And so in between the wires, so E and air, is not zero. So with this, this open switch it looks like a tiny capacitor in a way. And the potential difference across that switch must be numerically equivalent, equal to the, the EMF of the batteries. So questions about that? No. OK. So let's do one more thing with this problem before we, we stop. Um, we are asked to write uh, loop equations and node equations, which we could use to solve for the unknown currents. So how many equations do we need? Well, in this circuit, we have a current through bulb one, we have a current I2 through bulb two, and we have a current I3 through bulb three. And so that means we're gonna need, we have three different things, so we need three equations, three unknowns, three, 
equations. So the first thing we can do is choose location K as a node. And we say that that um, the current coming into K, or if we're talking about conventional current, conventional current would actually be going counterclockwise here. So we'll say um, the current coming into K I2 plus I3 has to be equal to the current going out of K, which is I1. So we have I2 plus I3 equals I1. And we can write some loop equations. We already wrote one loop with the switch closed. So, so we're talking about current with the switch closed now, sorry. So we'd have EMF, uh, the potential difference across bulb three and the potential difference across bulb one. So we'd have EMF minus I3 R3 minus I1 R1, which are the equals zero. And then we can choose one more loop equation. Um, we could actually just do a loop around uh, this little internal loop. The only rule for a loop is it can't cross itself. Uh, so if we go that way, conventional current is going to the left here. Uh, so This one would be positive and I, that one would be negative. So we'd have I2 R2 plus I3 R3 equals zero. And that gives us enough equations that we can actually solve the problem and get, get the currents. Um, and uh, <coughs> That's, we can do that by substitution. We'll leave that as an exercise to the, to the reader. And I will note that this problem is actually too long to be a one-step problem on a test, although pieces of it could be broken out as, as steps in tests. Questions about this? Okay, well, I'm inclined to stop here and uh, I'm gonna unmute you all. Uh, so you have a chance to, can you, yeah, I mean, you can use, can you row reduce? You can use whatever system you want for solving simultaneous equations. I like substitution, but if you wanna do matrix operations or determinants or adding equations or your, your favorite way of solving simultaneous equations, you can do that. <clears throat>